I just finished watching Unbalanced and I am no longer mentally stable. What's up guys, Funari Lover 47 here, welcome to Watching for the Plot. What I essentially do is troll through the catacombs, the dark sparse internet to find animated rock videos and then criticize them on the internet because no one's going to talk about them remote. But if you do, subscribe for more. I really should shorten my intro. So this show we are reviewing today is called Unbalanced and we are back to that curse grind. And yeah, it does suck because while I was watching it, I could feel my brain flattening. However, I do miss preaching on top of my soapbox, so until we find another wholesome hentai, then we are stuck with whatever refuse I happen to find. Don't get me wrong, it is disturbing. There are bodily fluids, black male, mind break, sociopathic main character who doesn't care about anyone else but itself. Just put all that to the side because it's aesthetically pleasing, editing wise. The fact that it's not as disturbing as it could possibly be like pigeon blood is something to say at least. A brief summary of the plot goes as follows. June wants someone to replace his dead sister whom would perform any and all sex act files for him or in front of a live studio audience and they are heavily insinuating that she committed suicide. Well, yeah. And he's trying to find his next target. For lack of a better word, to love him as much as he loved his sister Masato. Nope, I'm not going to break that down any further. Let's go on. Episode 1. So this persona slash monogatari editing style is phenomenal to watch and the fact that this was made before those mediums could say that Unbalanced was a trendsetter and the editing aspect, not anything else. Dear God, not anything else, please God. So now that I got the one and only positive out of the way, let's relentlessly bash it into oblivion. So mind break is definitely a thing, guys. Just want to let you know that again. And so if you didn't believe mind break was ever a thing, this show was definitely proof. His first victim named Mika, who is also related to Masato somehow, is desperately trying to replace her. Now, I'm not sure where this yearning is coming from, but her only life goal is to be as successful of an intimate partner as her sister was. I can only assume it's because Masato's untimely death and Mika's way of mourning is... The more I think about it, the more dread I start to feel. So let's move on. Obviously, June is like, hey, no. She keeps insisting, and then he's like, fine. But to be on her level, he had to test her out, and he puts her through so much humiliation and torture that this episode feels like a clean three hours. But it's only 30 minutes long, I swear. These acts include treating her like a dog with a lit firecracker and her remote control vibrating phallic shaped object that he has control over while she's working, pouring wine in her vagina, and then banana there are about three other acts that i haven't mentioned and one of his main objectives is to test her devotion by telling her to have sex with all these strangers because he said so and another objective that could contradict my whole him being a sociopath thing i mentioned earlier that theory there is that at the very beginning of the series he says this so clearly this man has emotions, he has feelings, and doesn't necessarily want Mika to enter this lifestyle. But the moment she said yes, he went right into training her, their quotations again, at the restaurant called Hungry Bear. And the synopsis states, it is a restaurant that can fuel any of your carnal desires, so do that with what you must. So I can only assume that June is a supervisor, like how Dialyte was in Pigeon Blood, and he's in charge of training women, quote unquote. I almost want to say yes to this fully, but the last episode shatters that theory entirely, so we gotta just keep that under the rug because that just will never be a thing that'll come to fruition. So at the end of the episode, after Mika has been broken in again, for lack of better words, she's now getting ran through several clients at a time and will never have sex with June again. However, she is slowly ascending to reaching Masato's level of being the best e-girl of all time. So I can only assume she's slightly happy, right? Okay, it's, it's just spoof on. Episode 2. So the hungry bear from here on out is going to be extremely crucial to the plot for the next two episodes. Did I say this was three episodes long, by the way? Have you guys ever heard of this word called blackmail? So June's next victim is Suzuhara. And let's just say that there's layers to this. So one day when she was chilling, doing I don't know what exactly, but it doesn't really matter because when she went to take a drink, surprise, surprise, it was drugged and Hirakawa here, this shrimp nugget, kidnapped her took pictures of her naked and has been blackmailing her ever since by saying unless you do this then I'll release these pictures of you and apparently that was enough so he offered her money as well and she's been stuck ever since now before you go and say why didn't she call the cops her father died and left insane amounts of debt for her to pay off so this stable income for her is helping despite it being so exploitative and here we are so our man June finds all of this out and decides to save her from Hirakawa's next shoot and walks her home. Now here's where it gets worse. So after arriving home, after saving her, June 
Uh, it, <laughs> the thing is, he is at her house. Remember that, he's at her house. June pours her a drink in her house again. And surprise, surprise, with drugs. Apparently, he carries pills around. I don't. I don't understand that logic whatsoever. And June goes exploring her apartment and finds out that she has an entire catalog of her doing her OnlyFans materials in VHS format because early 2000s was a thing. And looking at this library, there are easily dozens upon dozens of tapes. So I hypothetically went to the scenario here. If they have been doing this daily ever since she was captured, then I can only assume it's been about a month and some change. And just speaking of change, how much money do you think that was? I mean, all she's doing is just OnlyFans content and our man june says hey you want to up your game and then after that he leaves and once he leaves we flash to suzuhara and june at his house and he basically offers her a position like hey you want to be a sex slave forever and your life will never be the same and then she's like fuck it my life was never normal anyway <laughs>私にとって普通の生活なんて何の意味もない。辛くて寂しいだけの毎日だった。これでいいの。これでいいんだわ。この階段を降りたら私は二度と日の当たる世界には戻れない。この階段を降りたら私はあの人のものになる。And now she is a permanent sex slave. And that's how they end up episode two. Wow, just wow. Episode three. <laughs> this is an odd one to end this series on, mainly because of the fact that the only thing this answers is what June's true intentions of were working at the Hungry Bear rather than actually wrapping up the entire series. So yeah, there's that. The manager and the owner of the restaurant are talking about this girl's father here after the restaurant closed. And apparently he's in charge of their credit, whatever that means. Business people don't sue me. I don't know what being in charge of credit means. I don't I don't I don't know. And the said father has a daughter working at the same restaurant sex trafficking business that he's in charge of credit of. So I wonder why he's backing out. For some odd reason as you may or may not have noticed, June has simultaneously bugged them and found Ritika walking home alone. This man is a bit too lucky. How do you so happen to one bug both the owner and the manager of the restaurant after hours at the same time they were talking about their nefarious acts wide out in the open and two while you were eavesdropping on said conversation happened to stumble across their intended target weeks ago makes sense the reason june was following her was to keep her away from isolated places as often as possible and to do that he asked her out not because he liked her obviously he's psychotic it's because he wanted to protect her for the time being the reason i said that was because he was going to use her as a decoy to see his true plans come to fruition after wandering around the town and carrying this sensor coffee and after finding out Rizuko's father is going to love hotel for another woman, we come to find that June was actually married to Masato. And as you may or may not have noticed by now, whenever June mentions Masato, he's in full-fledged Kuma mode. And they go back to his house, and of course he drugs her, and you can already fill in the blanks for that. And I just noticed something about this man. He has Mika and Masato plastered all over his walls in this room for some reason. That's very odd to me. After a clean or not so clean. 10 minutes of intercourse, June puts her to the test as he did with Mika by telling her to wear this BDSM chainmail doohickey thingamabob underneath her uniform. And here we are. And here is where I mean he was using her as bait rather than protecting her. この人たち店長に頼まれたって言ってたけどああ黒幕は社長の三崎由美子だどういうことこの件は俺に任せてくれないかな I like how no one back in the day ever puts epilepsy warnings on anything because they're editing something else. So after immediately confirming that Yumiko really did set everything up, the manager's name was Yumiko by the way. He pulls up to her. Yep, 
He has legit evidence of every single thing that they did to try to destroy Gochiro's legitimacy as a businessman. And once he confronts Yumiko with all that information, he puts her in a cage and again, you can film the rest here because this man's evil, he's vile, he's rude, he's a menace to society. However, the one thing that is quite intriguing is the fact that one of his motives to do all this was so he can own the Hungry Bear restaurant. Now, why would a sex crave kuming sadist want a sex trafficking restaurant? That part is obvious. But why does June want that restaurant? Why did he go out of his way to perform his vigilante justice just to own the restaurant? The only hint they gave is this final scene here where he goes to Risco's house and has sex with her yet again. And the final thing she says is, and I quote, and so like the devil, he managed to charm my parents as well. What does that mean? How is that the way you decided to end the series? I mean, if you look at it like an episodic format, this is definitely for you. Compared to what I've seen so far aesthetically, it hits all the right notes. So I can't even say it's absolute trash. Its plot is solely based on whoever the target is. And if you're enamored with said target June is eyeing for, then your opinion from episode to episode may vary. All right, guys, I don't have an outro, but if I did, it wouldn't matter because I'm not looking for the video. Good night.